I love Green School. I love its inspiring architecture. I love the amazing teachers that work hard to make it what it is. But most of all, I love the intentional, caring energy of our community. You see, I came to Green School in fifth grade after having done a year at an IB school and two years at a group homeschooling project run out of a villa in Shanggu. While these were overall interesting experiences, I felt like my learning had little meaning, and my opinions existed in a vacuum. School felt like nothing more than a chore, and I hardly ever felt inspired to achieve. Granted, I was in primary school, but even then, shouldn't children be developing a passion for learning rather than a disdain for it? When I arrived at Green School, I had little sense of direction in my learning. However, this began to change as I was immediately struck by how my peers accepted me and how my teachers really wanted me to get excited about learning. So you should know that when I was in middle school, I was this big history nerd. I'd spent hours and hours on Wikipedia and YouTube rabbit holes searching up random historical events or phenomena. I couldn't get enough of it. So pretty early on, I realized that there wasn't much of a history curriculum developed into my learning. I asked my teacher at the time, why? I kind of expected to be shut down and discouraged, but instead, my question led me to being encouraged to speak about this at assembly to my fellow students and to the teachers that might actually integrate my interests somehow. This was my first time presenting in front of a large crowd, and I was shaking and stuttering as I did it. It might not have had the immediate effect I wanted, but the point is that the younger me was heard at a higher level as a member of the student community. I was pushed to get out of my comfort zone and advocate for my beliefs. That meant a lot to me at the time. So much so that it planted in me an idea that, in fact, my voice matters. So later on, I formed the first middle school student council, along with a few of my most diligent peers. <laughs> OK, I'll be honest. I'll be honest, we didn't do all that much. It was more of a way, it was more of an excuse for me to fulfill my fantasy of becoming president someday. But still, we were encouraged to see what we could do with such an organization. And that's what really matters. We were pushed to try. Another example, this is the Quest presentations, where we, as grade 8 students, were all encouraged to research and present about something that mattered deeply to us. In my case, I was able to delve into my own Armenian heritage to understand why genocides occur and how they can be prevented. This is something that I'm still extremely passionate about. So in three short years at Green School, I had become aware of just how much I cared about what I was doing at school. And I still feel proud talking about it to this day. This all meant that by the time I entered high school, I had gone from being shy, lonely, and unsure of myself to being confident, articulate, and most importantly, ready to keep learning. This school champions its students by empowering us to take an active part in guiding our own learning. And I'm leaving it now ready to find my purpose in the world. OK, we all get it. I'm a sucker for this school. <laughs> but the bottom line is that this school has brought me a long way. And the opportunities it affords its students are something you can seldom get elsewhere in the world. So when last year, the large restructuring we all know about was announced, I found the perfect excuse to go back down another rabbit hole and see what was happening to the school that had grown very close to my heart. But before I drag you down that rabbit hole with me, I want to talk about how history has a tendency to repeat itself and why that makes it imperative that we finally fix our way of doing things. Daisy Janes. Some of you may have heard about her. She was a senior giving a Greenstone presentation four years ago today in this very amphitheater. She also spoke in the aftermath of a misguided restructuring decision. She had spent her Greenstone trying to get students on what was then Green School's main governing body, the Board of Management, to put the community, and especially the students, at the center. Right as this was about to come to fruition, however, a major restructuring was announced by the Board of Trustees, a restructuring that would completely do away with the Board of Management and replace it with a single executive position. In her speech, she explained this and argued, rightfully I would say, that this did not align with the progressive model of education that Green School strives for, where students have agency over their own learning. This wasn't just a concern of hers, however. Much of the community had become heavily invested in critiquing and attempting to reverse this change. In fact, the outcry was so intense that the person assigned to the executive position himself eventually resigned. In the following years, certain concessions by the Board of Trustees were made. 
as a response to both Daisy's speech and the situation as a whole, though not as much as she had hoped for. Although students weren't given a place on the Board of Management, they were given a place on Green School's newly created advisory board, the Board of Learners. And so it seemed that because of the community's action, there was hope, even if only a little, for Green School to learn from its previous mistakes. However, despite this, we still land in the recent restructuring controversy. Essentially, the idea was and still is to replace the current four learning neighborhood head positions with just two learning neighborhood head positions. In addition, there will also be two specialist roles, a curriculum innovation specialist and a student experience specialist. The change is clear, but what isn't clear is why exactly this is needed and how exactly it'll all work, especially given that the existing system seems, at least from a student's perspective, to work quite well. This didn't bode well with me when I first heard about it, and I wanted to know more. I attended the student Q&As, I talked to my peers, and I even asked veteran community members and administrators what they thought the purpose of this was. The consensus? There was none. It felt like no one had the same information or perspective. Everyone was operating on conjecture, making different judgments based on their own opinions. They were filling in the gaps left by a failure in process. So, because of the collective confusion and seeming lack of consultation, I decided, along with a few of my most diligent peers, that we would take action. We had one key objective, postpone the restructuring decision to create a dialogue between the decision makers and the community. When we saw that the school intended to go ahead with the decision and our requests for a dialogue weren't being granted, we decided to take it up the corporate ladder. We wrote a formal email to key people at EIM for, an, for a postponement of the decision until an open conversation could be had. This was responded to, but again, with little regard for our concerns. However, as an intentional and caring group of students, we were determined. We began collecting signatures for a petition to support our request. We created certs in solidarity with the Ellen heads that would lose their positions or no longer keep their positions. We even held a protest at a Spirit Friday to request an open conversation with EIM directly. And to their credit, EIM eventually agreed to meet face to face. And while it felt positive and productive, it has since resulted in insufficient change to rebuild trust and address the structural and cultural governance failures that led to the situation in the first place. I don't know exactly why this is. It could be that there are thought to be more immediate items on the agenda. It could be a fear of incurring more community backlash or perhaps something else. The point is, we still have a problem. Unlike in Daisy's time, though, we have a golden opportunity to begin to fix this problem in a sustainable way. I propose outlining a process for community and administrative consultation, the lessons learned from drafting Green School's new strategic plan as a catalyst for this. This doesn't mean that everyone gets a voice in every decision ever. There becomes a point where inputs are inefficient. But this does mean being transparent and bringing a diversity of community perspectives into strategic decisions, building trust in our administration, which in turn allows better decisions to be made with efficiency. It may seem impossible, but if the nations of Europe were able to emerge from the most devastating war on the planet with a stronger set of values and a better quality of life for their people, then we too can come away from this stronger. I know, inner history nerd there, but seriously, Every phoenix must emerge from the ashes, right? We have a chance here to overcome this problem as a community in a way that would be effective and build trust in the process. We must finally take it. Because it seems to me that the issue we're facing here is like the one at Hogwarts, where the Chamber of Secrets opens every few years and history keeps repeating itself, causing crisis after crisis at the school. To summarize again, four years ago, Daisy Janes had advocated for students to have a seat on the Board of Management. However, it was dissolved and replaced with the Board of Learners, all without any communication or input. Now, once again, the issue has been the creation of another new school structure without the consultation of the community or even the, the governance bodies of Green School, such as GSEC and the Board of Learners, first. This made sure that both decisions were and are not being executed efficiently and received little support. So, the golden opportunity I'm discussing with you today is not about paying lip service, putting students on unused advisory boards, or writing lofty policies. But doubling down and making collaboration an integral part 
of the Green School decision-making process. Again, that's not to say that everyone should get what they want, but that does mean that decisions should be informed and recognize people's perspectives. Remember that time I told you about when I presented in front of middle school for the first time? I was being told that what I thought and said was in some way important to the school. If that's true, then why aren't we valuing or continuing to value the concerns of people like Daisy Janes or the concerns of the student representatives and I during our efforts recently? After all, students know best if their learning is working or not. It makes sense to give us agency and a chance to have a say in the organization that builds us into adults. And this applies to other stakeholder groups, such as parents and teachers, too. We all have unique perspectives that can bring much additional value to decisions. Shouldn't we somehow channel the immense expertise of the Green School community? The top-down model of decision-making was, after all, used by governments for millennia, and it has resulted in humanity racing towards our extinction due to climate change. It doesn't work. If we want to be sustainable, we have to rethink the systems through which we make decisions. We're not a democracy. Sure, but that doesn't mean that we should dismiss our stakeholders. Back to golden opportunities. This year, Ibu Kate and I were given one. We were asked to take the lead on facilitating the development of Green School's new strategic plan for the next three years. And so we did. And when we did, we made it a point to consult the community, use literally thousands of pieces of data from throughout Green School's history, and update the community on progress. We made it to address community, administrative, and educational concerns and goals. It starts with a story. A story of the destruction and later restoration of a great forest that reminds us of the threat of climate change and green schools, and thus this plan's purpose in the world. Through this story, we also reveal the five key aims of the plan, which all lead into one another, and are represented by student-illustrated spirit animals, drawn by Avell, another graduating senior. As you can see, they are grow a trusting and caring culture within which students and educators thrive, supporting students to lead the change, to respect and regenerate our world, and connect with others far and wide. <laughs> Under each of these, there are specific objectives to make sure that we can turn for year one of the plan to make sure that we can turn these broader strategic goals into actions that can be directly worked on. There are also champions for each of the five key aims of the plan to activate work on these objectives and to make sure they're moving forward on a broader strategic goal level. But we didn't want to just create a boring to-do list that less than a dozen people will bother to look at. We wanted to inspire and create a plan that people could see was being fulfilled. Thus, we also created measurements to remain sure that those responsible remain activated and so that the community and the administration can be kept informed on progress through regular reports. This will also be supplemented by the use of the Board of Learners, which is made up of community members, as a body to review the work of the champions and see where they can provide support and counsel to make sure that Green School is achieving its aspirations. We also want to establish a direct feedback mechanism for the community to make sure there is communication between the school and those the school aims to serve. It may have taken more time and effort, but we made a plan that was way more awesome and potentially effective because of the community's involvement, not in spite of it. This is not something that will get lost in a filing cabinet a month or so into its, into its implementation. This is something that will be sustainable if used correctly. This is why I think that the way in which this plan was created could be a model for how we do things moving forward at Green School, a way that creates more clarity and refined decisions rebuilding trust in our administration by stating clearly what the school is going to do and then doing that. At the same time, though, I don't think the strategic plan and the way it was developed is perfect. There were only two of us committing a significant amount of time to this, and because we were doing something completely new, we had to build the process from the ground up. I don't think our work is completely over. We could have done consultation more effectively. This means that part of using this plan as a model is learning from its shortcomings. Firstly, we have to delineate how we gather input for major decisions effectively. To the school's credit, they're already developing a policy to do just that. But this policy, if not implemented effectively, doesn't mean anything yet. In the context of this strategic plan specifically, though, this means continuing the conversation around its efficacy, goals, and priorities 
to make sure Green School really is becoming the school of the future with the community that makes this possible behind it. Let's not call it here. Let's keep the momentum going. The strategic plan is a start, but our work as a school is not yet done. We all came to Green School in some way because we wanted a progressive model of education that celebrates a, develop, a diversity of perspectives. Given this, I don't believe that Green School can keep making the same mistakes. We can't expect to expand and bring what we are to more people if what we are gets lost along the way. So I ask Green School, its community, its administration, the IM, let's make this controversy a pivot in a positive direction that uses consultation and transparency to rebuild trust and create better decisions in the process. Without this, we'll stay stuck in a constant cycle of scrutiny where our community is always on edge and our administrators can't do their jobs effectively without being constantly criticized, regardless of what they do. Let's start acting like a community of learners making our world sustainable. Together, learning from our mistakes and fixing things here on the home front before we seek to change the world. So I'll end, as all good speeches do, of course, with a quote. Henry Ford once said, if you think you can, or you think you can, you're right either way. It's time to think we can. Thank you. <laughs>